graduating students, dear parents, family, and friends, dear members of our board, Susan, Kimberly, Jens, dear Bard College Berlin community. Only four days ago, we opened a window upon a new chapter of life at Bard College Berlin with the inauguration of Henry Kerner Hall. Today, we are opening up not one, but many windows. And what we see are not always entirely clear cut, but nevertheless very promising vistas of the new chapters in your lives. Now, what do windows do? How do we use them? How do we look and see? And what do we look for? Virginia Woolf describes Mr. Ramsey, who looks out of the window, sees the bad weather approaching, and declares that there will be no landing at the lighthouse tomorrow. Etia Hoffman, as an old man, looking through a high up corner window at the hustle and bustle on Gendarme Markt, and he advises his young cousin to focus on one person at a time for as long as possible, as fixating the gaze creates clear seeing. Siegfried Krakauer finds the city life he witnesses outside of his window so much densified and intensified that he sees in it the magic of a natural landscape. And then there's Fernando Pessoa. He leans out of the window of his office in a busy quarter of Lisbon during his lunchtime. And he sees before him the life on a farm. And when he returns to reality, he says, I look around, smiling. And before anything else, I shake all the dust of the elbows of my unhappily dark suit. No one dusted the window rail, ignorant of the fact that one day, for a single moment, that rail would be a ship's rail without any possible dust, a ship sailing on an infinite tour. I hope you will always remember that there are moments to be just factual, moments to zoom in on detail, moments to deal with complexities, and moments to dream. Do not forget to dream. May I now invite Dean Catherine Toll. Thank you. Hi everybody, welcome to our soon-to-be graduates, to your parents, siblings, friends, to everybody here from Bard College Berlin, and to the friends and supporters of the college from Berlin and from further afield. On behalf of all of us, congratulations to the graduates. As the students know, the professors and the staff of the college are paragons of professional reserve, but they do get a bit sentimental on graduation day, especially on this occasion. Earlier this week, we marked a significant expansion of the university in its anniversary year, but today we pay tribute to efforts, achievements, and dedication that represent the realization of the ideals and attitudes of mind that were spoken about by our distinguished visitors at that event, of daring to seek after knowledge and of service to the community. In this spirit, we welcome the newest member of the Board of Governors of Bard College Berlin, Kimberly Emerson, as our commencement speaker. Kimberly is a lawyer, civic leader, and human rights advocate. She serves on the board of directors of Human Rights Watch, the advisory board of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Pacific Council on International Policy. She's a founding member of the Transatlantic Advisory Board of the United Way in Germany, and among her many contributions to furthering political, civic, and social justice has been her work as an election observer in Nigeria, her contributions to relief projects 
related to the rescue of and provision for asylum seekers in Greece in 2015, her work in Sri Lanka following the devastation of the tsunami in 2004, and in New Orleans after the hurricane of 2005. She has been the recipi recipient of several awards for her civic engagement endeavors. From 2013 to 17, Kimberly Emerson lived here in Berlin with her husband, the US ambassador to Germany, John B. Emerson, and worked with the US embassy as well as independently on multiple projects, including the promotion of German immigration and integration efforts to rel related to what was called the refugee crisis of 2015, and addressing the issue of the underrepresentation of women in economic and political decision making. Before coming to Germany, Kimberly worked in the Clinton administration as a senior political appointee and spokesperson for the US Information Agency, now part of the State Department. She has been deeply active in US presidential politics and helped many Democratic candidates on the local, state, and federal level. Previously, Kimberly practiced law with the firm Tuttle & Taylor and worked in Hollywood as a business and creative executive with Savoy Pictures and Sony Entertainment. She holds degrees from UCLA, UC Hastings College of the Law, and l'Université de Droit de l'Ex-Marseille. During her tenure of only a few months so far on the Bard College Berlin Board of Governors, Kimberly has already been extremely active to the benefit of current and prospective students and graduates of the college. She's a very nice, generous, and genuine person. Please join me in welcoming her to share her thoughts with you on this graduation day. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Dean Toll, for that generous introduction. Um, I also want to thank you, Dr. Becker, and uh, Dr. Toy, and Dean Bystrom, and of course, the members of the board who are here, and your entire academic and administrative teams for your leadership of the Bard College Berlin. Thank you. You do a wonderful job. I want you all to know that my two of my three daughters are here with me today. Uh, my twins, Taylor and Haley Emerson, who are just have just finished their junior years abroad uh, in London and Copenhagen. And uh, so they're going to be watching you graduates to see how it's done, because they graduate next year from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. But I'm super pleased they could be with us today. Uh, yay. <laughs> Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the extraordinary work of all the professors and the entire staff at BCB. Thank you. Thank you for believing in your undergrads and helping to nurture their intellects, their creativity, their dreams, and their ambitions. I had the opportunity to begin to get to know Bard College Berlin while my husband was U.S. Ambassador here. But I was truly introduced last year uh, when I visited your campus and for the first time met some of you and of course some of you students and sat in on a class. Since then, I've learned much about the college from Dr. Botstein, Dr. Becker, Professor Bystrom and many others. To bring the highest tradition of specialized study and place it within a broader learning of social thought, to research the changes and movements of the world through history, culture, and politics. In other words, a true liberal arts education in the heart of Europe. I was so lucky to join you all last Tuesday for the opening of Henry Kerner Hall, what a fantastic addition to this growing institution. Congratulations. I thought it was absolutely wonderfully presented. And I love the art throughout it. 
I also attended a recent dinner to recognize the success of the program for international education and social change, providing scholarships for 32 students who've come to Germany from countries in crisis and conflict and who are now studying for their degrees in humanities and social thought. Two of you are graduating today, Ahmad Mobayed and Mohanad Kakoni. Incredible. After having the opportunity to actually read your thesis, Muhannad, um, entitled We Refugees, which completely spoke to my social justice heart, I think you should be up here giving this speech instead of me. Where are you? Both of you, what a, what a, what a laudable accomplishment, what a remarkable program. So. Keep it up, keep going with it, you guys. It's incredible. So now I would like to ask the class of 2019 to join me in one final thank you, which is to your community, whether that means your parents, your extended family, partners, professors, administrators, advisors, mentors, or friends who have done so much to help you reach this momentous day. Can we have you say thank you to them? And now I want to ask, actually, it's not the end of my speech, I just want to ask everyone to rise for a minute so that we can all congratulate the real stars of today, the graduates of the Bard College Berlin class of 2019. You did it. You did it. I just wanted to say congratulations at the beginning and the end. Okay. Thank you. I know there were times, especially during the past couple of years, when you asked yourselves, why on earth did I sign up for this program? Well, while you're still recovering from presenting your theses or sitting for exams, you may not recognize it yet, but the breadth and the depth of the programs you just completed and the diversity of your student cohort 51 students representing 29 different countries will prove to be invaluable to you as you go through life. Why? If you think about it, the purpose of education is to prepare you for life in the outside world, to teach you critical thinking, to encourage your curiosity and openness to different peoples and cultures, and to give you the confidence to question, to grow, and to continue to learn. In today's world, to be life and career ready, students must be able to master more than just core subjects. They must also be able to master the knowledge and skills that are part of what we call global competencies. The world in which we live is ever more interconnected and interdependent, especially because of technology. Weekly, I jump on global video and audio conference calls with Human Rights Watch colleagues and board colleagues and staff. My colleagues are in Tokyo, Paris, Mexico, New York, Australia, Los Angeles, Brussels, London, Berlin, Silicon Valley, Switzerland, to name a few. Yes, it's a bit of a time zone problem, but not a connectivity problem. Let me give you an example from the Human Rights Watch field of this interconnectivity. Satellite images of burning Rohingya villages in Myanmar, taken by satellites belonging to a company in San Francisco, which donated the images to Human Rights Watch, along with eyewitness testimony taken from fleeing Rohingya by our researchers on the Bangladesh-Myanmar border, were transmitted to our advocacy team at the UN in Geneva. This team then used them to persuade the UN Human Rights Council that indeed the Myanmar military committed a genocide. In another example closer to home, an HRW Human Rights Watch researcher on the island of Lesbos tweeted pictures in a press release shining a light on human rights abuses 
to which trapped refugees were being subjected. Her tweets were retweeted around the world by our New York-based communications team, grabbed by Human Rights Watch's advocacy team in Brussels to push the EU into action, sometimes successfully, but not often enough, and were picked up and published by 50 to 100 newspapers and news outlets around the globe. This kind of thing happens on a daily basis. These are just a couple of real-time examples of how the intertwining of our lives through technology and communications, along with true human interaction, can be used to do good. But what about the other side? What about the use of these tools to surveil normal citizens, to create fake news that sets off violent acts, to, to, to identify, track down, and arrest peaceful protesters? Where do you fit in? The challenges and opportunities of the coming years will define the contours of your lives. The better you are able to assess, question, and judge their value, and to take appropriate action, whatever that may be, the better you will move through this complex world. But another very, very important aspect of success Something that perhaps gets overlooked in this age of data, robots, digitalization, and artificial intelligence is the extent to which you interact peacefully, respectively, and productively with fellow human beings from diverse ge geographies. Students such as yourselves, who are fortunate enough to have had the opportunity to attend a college like Bard Berlin, either by living a part of your life in a country other than your own, or simply by going to school with people from other places, you have an enormous advantage. You have learned to engage and go beyond textbooks, to study complex topics based on real world issues, some that you yourselves have lived. You have learned to reach across traditional disciplines and explore how the relationships of history, literature, politics, social justice, and art are interwoven and interconnected. The liberal arts cliche that, an edu that such an education teaches you to learn to think actually holds a serious idea. Brilliant author David Foster Wallace said, learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you pay attention to, and to choose how you construct meaning from experience. Each student in this graduating class has his or her own unique story. I don't know all of you, but I do know this. Each one of you in the class of 2019, during your time at Bard Berlin, had a moment when you tapped into your unique potential and challenged yourselves to try something outside of your comfort zone. It may have been tackling an assignment or academic problem you didn't think you would ever understand and then mastering it. It may have been working to excel at playing a musical instrument, speaking in public for the first time, or presenting an original artistic creation. It may have been engaging in or creating an innovative community service program, or you may have mentored or tutored another student or helped a friend who was going through an emotionally challenging time. Or you may have failed at something and lost all of your confidence, but then picked yourself up and moved on to another day. These are the experiences that will mean more to you over the coming years than whether you got a high score on a given test. Take these experiences with you as you go out into the world and continue to challenge yourselves. Because as you move on in life, your achievements will be measured not in terms of grades and awards. Your successes will depend on how you learn and absorb new ideas and concepts, whether you find and pursue your passion, and how you interact with people. Interestingly enough, your successes will be measured not only by what you attain, but also by what you give back, how you live your life, 
your principles, your moral center of gravity. This may all sound a little daunting, but building upon your experiences to date will be a natural progression, a process defined by the choices you make. So with that in mind, let me share 10 life lessons I've picked up along the way. I actually have more than 10, but we only have so much time and I know you wanna get your degrees. So first, here's the good news. Science tells us that it will be common for members of the class of 2019 to live past the age of 100. <laughs> what that means is you can expect to have multiple jobs, even careers. And some may be in fields that have not yet even been invented. Look at me, for example. From the age of 10, I believed I was destined to be a great actress. I studied theater with the best teachers outside of school and at UCLA, and played a small character on a TV show when I was 18. I went to law school and as a lawyer worked in private practice. I was hired by a presidential campaign. I was a senior executive in Hollywood developing film and TV projects for two studios. I served in the US government and after our three daughters were born, I served on a number of nonprofit boards and still do. I would even count being an ambassador spouse as a job because, well, I've hardly ever worked so hard and for free, I might add. Now I'm writing a book, and while I'm writing a book, I continue to pursue my passion, human rights. Some say I can't hold a career, let alone a job. But trust me, your careers with, will without a doubt be just as varied, if not more. You will need to be lifelong learners. Think about it. When I graduated from law school, there were no cell phones, no DVDs, no laptops, no tablets. There was no such thing as texting. There were hardly any personal computers and there was no internet. Television had seven or eight channels. Social networking consisted of handwritten thank you notes and holiday cards. It's not that I've been around forever. Don't say anything. No, I haven't been around forever. It's just that change is happening so quickly and that's going to continue. So. Lesson number one, be open to new ideas and new ways of thinking, and above all, stay flexible. And this leads to lesson number two, seize the opportunity. Richard Branson, the founder of Virgin Records, Virgin Airlines, and the more recent space flight company, Virgin Galactic, once said, if somebody offers you an amazing opportunity, but you are not sure you can do it, say yes then learn how to do it later. It sounds like there may be a little bit of entrepreneurial recklessness in Branson's statement, but think about it. He's not saying if you know you can't do something, he's saying if you are not sure you can do it, not sure. That means you probably already have some foundation, in which case say yes. When a U.S. Democratic presidential candidate asked me to join his campaign and organize his first huge event in Los Angeles, I was initially very anxious, but I said yes. I was in my late 20s, didn't have any experience, but believed I had the skills. Detail orientation, I was pretty good at logistics, I had been trained to be a rational thinker, um, I thought I was pretty creative, and, um, and I could see how an event should look, you know, how an event should execute. I worked with a great but also very exper inexperienced partner. Instead of an expected audience of 500, over a thousand people showed up to our event to meet and greet the candidate, and he was great, and it was like this huge lift for him. And it was so successful that the campaign immediately asked me to fly to Texas and organize an even bigger one, and from there, my engagement snowballed. I became one of the top advanced people during the 1988 U.S. presidential campaign. That's what Branson's talking about. And this dovetails with something Oprah Winfrey said. She said, luck is preparation 
meeting opportunity. Recognizing an opportunity and seizing it lies near the heart of success. It demands flexibility, openness, and creativity, as well as courage, because there is a quality of stepping into the unknown. And yes, there are risks, but those risks can be diminished with good preparation, and then you create your own luck. Lesson number three, and this is related to seizing opportunities. Remain ever curious. Indulge your intellectual curiosity. Perhaps this is your greatest asset, and it will help you to recognize and take advantage of your opportunities. You will meet a lot of people along the way, in school, at work, at parties, even on the bus. Keep an open heart and mind. People are endlessly interesting. I always say only boring people are bored. Ask questions when you meet people. Learn about their journeys and why they took the paths they traveled. Read about recent scientific discoveries. Seek out interesting ideas from creative thinkers. And think about where the world might be headed. Your Bard Berlin education has well prepared you for this. Thomas Edison's inventions created at least three new industries, namely electricity, motion pictures, and musical entertainment. Think of all the businesses and industries that have been created or enabled by the internet. Yet I guarantee you the folks who created the internet had no idea where it would lead. There are incredibly cool things being developed out there. Learn about them and think about how you might put them to use. And this leads to your next lesson. Find your passion or passions. Perhaps some of you graduating today already know what your passion is. Maybe it's ancient Chinese literature or the machinations of the European Union, post-war feminist political art, or climate change policy. You have discovered it through experience or perhaps research or just by chance. Others of you have yet to find it. Be patient. Not being patronizing, it's true. From my experience, you aren't necessarily born knowing what you love. You will constantly be exposed to new things. Try them. That's where you may find your passion. My husband, John, discovered his passion for presidential politics in his mid-20s when he helped a little-known senator from Colorado with a lot of good ideas run for president. That candidate, Gary Hart, had to end his campaign for personal reasons, but throughout the next 35 years, until today, John has pursued this passion, working either professionally or voluntarily for every Democratic presidential candidate since 1984. In the process, he's become an expert on political strategy, tactics, and analysis, as well as on domestic and foreign policy for the United States. As a result of his dedicated pursuit of something he loves, he was invited to serve in the President Clinton's White House and as President Obama's U.S. Ambassador to Germany. I only discovered my passion for human rights in my early 40s, completely by chance. I attended a number of fundraising dinners in Los Angeles for nonprofit organizations. I usually felt sympathy, sympathetic towards the causes, but I was not emotionally stirred. Hmm, that's a big test. Am I emotionally stirred by this? The Human Rights Watch dinner began the same way, and then the longer I sat and listened, the more it tugged on me. Investigating human rights abuses, exposing them to the world, and then getting changes made at the highest policy levels to eliminate these wrongs. Well, this spoke to my legal training and the idea of social justice embedded in my soul. That was 16 years ago, and I've never looked back. So it doesn't matter when, it just matters what. Your passion may be something you start as an extracurricular engagement, and then it evolves into a career, but it doesn't have to. Just know your life will be more enriched when you discover what you love. Next lesson, don't be afraid to take risks and fail. While John and I were serving the US and Germany, we frequently met with young entrepreneurs 
And coming from California, we were often asked about Silicon Valley, where business has thrived in part on embracing risk. But risk obviously includes the risk of complete failure. You know what they called a failed entrepreneur in Silicon Valley? Experienced. You will have failures in life, in your professional lives and in your personal lives. Learn from these failures and realize that with every disappointment, there comes opportunity. Don't be afraid to put yourself in a position where you might fail, because often failure leads to success. Resilience and grit and the ability to pick yourself up after you fall are some of the most important skills you will need as you make your way through life. J.K. Rowling once said, it is impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you might as well not have lived at all, in which case you fail by default. Remember that presidential campaign I mentioned? I threw myself into it, body and soul, left my law firm, worked on it full time for seven months. My goal was to land a job in the White House with the next US president, but my candidate lost. That failure, that door closed, but two other doors opened, professionally to a career in Hollywood and personally to a serious relationship with a man I had met during the campaign, John Emerson, who became my husband. I'm currently writing a book. Am I a published book author? Not yet. This is a first time endeavor. I've done a lot of writing, but this is scary sitting all day looking at blank pages and figuring out how to fill them. Though it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. I feel I have a story to tell. Is there a chance I may fail at getting it published? Sure, but I'm taking the journey. And that's what you have to do. You have to take the journey. Lesson six, keep your eyes on the prize, but pay attention to the path you're traveling. When I talk about being flexible and seizing opportunity, you are best able to do that by first doing a great job at what you're already doing. Think about where you're going, but in the work environment, for example, if you look too much past this job, you may not get to the next job. You're not likely to start out at the top. Work hard. I call it the 110% rule. Give it everything you've got. Plunge in to help with problems or tasks. Humility and gratitude work better than entitlement, which is the easiest way to stumble on your path. It's really important to show people how committed you are in the moment. Another important lesson, find mentors and mentor others. A few years ago, John and I met U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor when she was in Berlin. In speaking to a group of young people, she stressed the importance of mentors. She said, when a young person, even a gifted one, grows up without close living examples of what she may aspire to become, whether lawyer, scientist, artist, or leader in any realm, her goals remain abstract. Such models in books or on the news, however inspiring or revered, are too remote to be real, let alone influential. But a role model in the flesh provides more than inspiration. His or her very existence is confirmation of possibilities you may have every reason to doubt. It says to you, yes, Someone like me can do this. And you aren't limited to one mentor. You can have many. So look for people you want to be like. People can help to show you the ropes, people whose judgment you trust, and then be a mentor to others. Successful protégés often become great mentors themselves. And sometimes you learn the most by teaching and helping others. Final three lessons, eight. Build and maintain your relationships. You've developed great friends here, and hopefully even some mentors. 
Don't lose touch with them. You guys, this is so much easier now with Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and all these other social networking sites. You never know when you might be doing a project that a classmate might be perfect, a perfect partner for, or a friend might have a job or be able to offer you a piece of advice or an idea that will be helpful to you tomorrow. Build upon your relationships, adding new people and connecting them with your friends, old and new, be a connector. When Bill Clinton ran for president, people always talked about the fobs, the friends of Bill. Literally, these people served as the foundation of his campaign. But beyond that, life is more rewarding when you share your experiences with your friends. Life lesson number nine, treat others well and pay it forward, just as others have done before you. Do you know why you go to a college with such a great faculty? Because others have made the donations to support it. And in terms of paying it forward, as we all look to the challenges facing the world, we need all of you to get involved and stay involved. There are many ways to serve. It can be joining the helping professions or working in a, the public sector or be, becoming a volunteer in your community. We need engaged citizens who are grateful for the freedoms and the opportunities that they enjoy and I know that's something you take away from your years at Bard. We need young people eager to learn, not afraid to work hard, and we need men and women who will never shy away from asking tough questions or pointing out when people in power need to do better. You will be surprised, but more often not than not, people will judge you on the basis of how you treat others and not just friends, teachers, bosses, your ability to manage up, but also how you treat the people you work with, your colleagues, the people who serve you meals, fix your cars, and clean your workplace. There is no more true phrase than what goes around comes around, and there is no more important guide to life than the golden rule. Number 10. Now, this may be the most important lesson of all. As I said earlier, your life will be defined by the choices you make. When making big decisions, trust your instincts. First, seek advice from those whose judgment you respect, your family, friends, mentors. Write down pros and cons. Research your options. Do whatever you find useful in developing a well-informed gut. But the fact is, we can talk ourselves into pretty much anything. At this point in your lives, you are developing a very good sense of self. You already have a well-developed sense of what is right and what is wrong, what you enjoy and what you don't. So at the end of the day, if you don't feel it in your gut that something is right for you, then don't do it, even if everyone you're talking to says it's a great idea. And if, after careful consideration, you feel that you have just got to do something, go for it. Now, I said 10, but there's an overarching lesson for life. Have fun. <laughs> Life is a great adventure with its ups and its downs, and you will navigate it well if you find the humor in all that it throws at you. So work hard, but play hard too. Again, congratulations to all of you in the class of 2019. With your Bard Berlin education and the experiences you've already had, you are well prepared to meet the opportunities and challenges that lie before you. The story of what you do with those opportunities will be written over the thousands of days that follow today's ceremony. This cohort is so diverse that I know you will do extraordinary things across a number of different fields. And I guarantee you when I'm, that I'm speaking for everyone in this room when I say, we can't wait to see how it all will turn out. All the best.
now invite uh, Tanya Sharma and Santiago Oriol for the student awards. <laughs> ago, I wrote a blog post about almost graduating. I wrote about what it was going to feel like to be here on this stage, and now that I'm here, this feeling is nothing I can really articulate. I thought I'd said it all in that blog post, but words can't fully explain the weird feeling in my tummy. Could be the food from yesterday, but I suspect it's something more. How do we encapsulate four of the most important years of our life into a five-minute speech? How do we articulate how significant these years have been for us? But more importantly, how do we do justice and how do we represent collectively the diverse experiences of the 50 other graduating students here today? I guess one way to do that is by starting at the beginning. We came here in 2015 when winters were colder because climate change wasn't as bad and when the cafeteria served only one type of dessert. <laughs> it was a simpler time. <laughs> We were younger and slightly phased by the novelty of college, nervous at the new challenge that lay ahead of us, but deter determined to conquer it. BCB welcomed us with open arms, and instead of making the challenge easier for us, made us more prepared to deal with that challenge. It's been hard to get here. <clears throat> it has been hard. <laughs> Hello, and welcome again to our commencement ceremony. First of all, I would like to say thank you again to the organizers of this event, the student life team, Effie, Philip, Philippe, and Mergem. <laughs> and everyone else that has gotten us to this point. Scott, for always bearing our chaotic emails. <laughs> Marco, for both technological and emotional support. The list is endless, but without you, neither today nor the past four years would have been possible. I would also like to thank all our guests, friends, family, alumni, and faculty. Your presence today is the culmination of all our efforts, both as a recognition and as expression of the fact that without you, there would be no content to our learning, and no life in the gray sky that gladly today does not cover Berlin. This community has grown up together. I know everyone says this at the end of college, but very seriously, with the student body of 270, it's hard not to grow up together. It's like a family, a huge family, but a family nonetheless. I don't know how many of you have read Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, but it featured in my thesis and it's fresh in my head, so indulge me for a second. The novel is about 1,001 children born at the stroke of midnight on India's independence who grew up with the nation. Rushdie describes them as a group of oddballs representing collectivism, individualism, revolution, capitalism, socialism, altruism, science, religion, courage, and cowardice. It's basically us. <laughs> <laughs> Except instead of 1,001, we were 50 oddballs who were brought together at the stroke of L&T and who grew up with a small school. Some people left us along the way and some joined us. Some graduated a semester early and some are graduating a semester late. But most of us share a collective consciousness, mostly in the form of trauma from having to write our senior thesis. <laughs> but we do. Our collective memory encompasses all of the diverse experiences each and every one of us has had here at Bard and in Berlin. All the classes we've had, the trips we've taken, the places we've eaten, the people we've loved, everything B Berlin and BCB have offered to us. Forgive me now as I will address what follows mostly to our students. Four years, and yet it feels like only a day has passed. At dusk, we started marching with the brightness of the new and welcome down towards the Piraeus. As we walked along, the hands of Socrates left us to our own devices, <laughs> passing through the city of Florence and stumbling upon the diagrams of Galileo. In the afternoon, we paused to catch our breaths, only to quickly tap our heads at the blunt passages of Smith, Marx, and Robinson. 
and where night usually awaits one with rest and the sweetness of dark, the twisted paths of Ulysses were waiting for us. They kept us awake in confusion, just as Bloom <laughs> and Daedalus next to the fence. But just as the day ends, thankfully or sadly, it begins anew. Today, we woke to celebrate that all this walking has not left us unchanged. Though our eyes are the same as on the day Sultan and Lars welcomed us, with due instructions on security, fire escapes, and navigating the interesting forest of Panko, our looking has been forever marked. We have learned that being lost is key to looking, searching. We have learned that only listening can we hear our own voices. We have, learning, we have learned that realizing is not even a step, and that only by walking further may our seeing come to the world and to our hands. On less unfortunate occasions, we have learned the smell of humanity in the dorms and the virtue of patience whilst waiting for the M1. Face to face, the Lord spoke to you, but in front of me always stood one of you, having waited, eaten, slept together under not one, not two, not three, but four roofs. And this year, we'll have a new one added to our campus, so say thank you, new students. And in this manner, we have learned the meaning of the Socratic question. What is the power of rhetoric? What is politics? What is beauty and what is the good? And why does Hegel support monarchy? <laughs> <laughs> So why is there only one dessert in the cafeteria? <laughs> and after you learn the Socratic method of arguing, there's no going back. Ask my parents, they're right there. <laughs> They'll tell you what Socratic discourse looks like when I'm trying to negotiate not having to do my chores at home. I can't think of a better way to describe these four years than as an adventure. When we came into BCB, there were about 150 students, and now there are 270. There are new faces on campus, making their own memories and leaving their own marks. Uh, and in three months, there will be a new lot, little freshmen navigating this novelty exactly where we were four years ago. There are more student clubs now, more internship opportunities, more academic departments, more classroom spaces, more dessert in the cafeteria. The winters have gotten easier to deal with, or it could be the climate change, and we're all a little older and a little wiser. BCB lived before us, and BCB will continue to live on after us, in spite of us and because of us. So yeah, this has been an adventure. Not an easy one, and certainly not always a smooth ride, but one that we finished through all the highs and lows, through the warmest summers and the harshest winters that we've known with these people sitting right here. We held each other's hands and we went on an adventure. And in everything the city had to offer, we found our niches. We found spaces in which we flourished and thrived, spaces where we were comfortable being who we were, being with people that we loved and doing things that made us happy. And we did it with BCB every step of the way. All the museum visits, the late night donor kebabs, the poetry readings, the guest speakers, the internships, the protests and the rallies, the dead lady show. We had the city at our disposal, the M1, our trustworthy speed, available at our beck and call, provided that beck and call was every 15 minutes. <laughs> and a fantastic infrastructure to support our adventures. And that's why we're here today. And today, we speak to you as friends, colleagues, sisters, brothers, students. We're very honored. Besides these roofs and classrooms that had kept us in front of each other for four years, it is a relation of love that ties us all. Not love for what is gaudy and shiny. That is the love of the magpie. Love for one another, and love for something beyond us altogether, whether right out of this door or anywhere in this world. And as Diotima taught Socrates and Plato, and to be frank, Jeff, Michael, David, and Tracy taught us. <laughs> we now have the natural desire to continue bringing this to the world, which we have inhabited here in relative shelter, only to do so in beauty and never in ugliness. Whether we have spoken accordingly today will be a measure of how we have reflected what we now see in you. Judge and hear our words with care, as you have done to all the texts and paintings you have seen. Judge and hear with suspicion when tongues whisper in your ears things unknown. Joy and honesty will fill today, and perhaps justice and hardship tomorrow. This means that jarred and hopeful, we must say, till then, till tomorrow. 
You know that phrase, it takes a village to raise a child? It did for us. That village had 270 people that we love dearly with all our heart and who have grown up with us. And so graduating today feels not just like our success, but the school's success and the community's success. So today, I wish us all the courage to be the best version of ourselves, to embrace the struggles that come along the way and to overcome them with grace, to be stronger and better individuals, and to trust ourselves. To the class of 2019, we love you 3,000, and we wish that you take with you the indomitable spirit of energy, curiosity, confusion, creativity, love, and kindness, and that you remember the importance of community and family, for we would be nowhere without it. And now to end, for the second time today, we will hear a poem by Pessoa, Portuguese poet, under the name of Álvaro de Campos, in English roughly translated as postponement. After tomorrow, yes, only after tomorrow. I'll take tomorrow to think about after tomorrow. And that way, it shall be possible. But today, no. No. Today, nothing. Today, I cannot. The confused persistence of my objective subjectivity, the sleep of my real life, intercalary, the anticipated and infinite exhaustion, an exhaustion of worlds to take a tram, this sort of soul. Only after tomorrow, today I want to prepare myself. I want to prepare myself today to think tomorrow about the following day. That is the one that is decisive. I already have the plan traced out, but no. Today, I don't trace out plans. Tomorrow will be the day of plans. Tomorrow, I'll sit myself down at the desk to conquer the world, because I could only conquer the world after tomorrow. I have the urge to cry. I have the urge to cry all of a sudden, from within. No, you don't want to know anything else. It's secret, it is, I don't tell you. Only after tomorrow. When I was a child, the Sunday circus filled me with joy the whole week. Today, only the Sunday circus of the whole week of my childhood fills me with joy. But after tomorrow, I'll be somebody else, and then my life shall be victorious. And all my real qualities as intelligent, well-read, and pragmatist will be summoned by decree. But by decree, tomorrow. Today I wish to sleep, tomorrow I'll narrate it. For what concerns today, what is the spectacle that will repeat me in my childhood? Just so that I can buy the tickets tomorrow, because after tomorrow is when the spectacle is good. Before, no. Before, no. But after tomorrow, I'll have the public access to that, which tomorrow I'll study. Yes, after tomorrow, I'll finally be what today I cannot be. Only after tomorrow, I'm drowsy like the coldness of a stray dog. I'm very drowsy. Tomorrow, I'll tell you some words, or after tomorrow. Yes, perhaps only after tomorrow. The future, yes, the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear guests, graduates, future alumni, you as future alumni can look back to two lines of institutional tradition. Bard College in New York was founded in 1860. Bard College Berlin was founded 20 years ago, 1999, as the European College of Liberal Arts. And despite the name change, there has been unbroken continuity since the state in mission, in curriculum, and in quite a bit of personnel. And no one embodies this continuity more than Jens Reich, the chairman of our board of governors. This year, 2018 to 2019, was a big year for our board of governors. We appointed three new members, you've heard it, Susan Gillespie, who is here today, 
Ken Roth, the president of Human Rights Watch, I think one of the most important institutions of any kind in the world, and Kimberly Emerson. Jens Reich is an eminent scientist, physician, molecular biology, biomathematician. In 1989, he co-founded the platform Neues Forum as one of the most prominent civic rights leaders in the GDR and throughout German unification. In 1994, he was proposed by an independent initiative and then nominated by the Green Party Bündnis 90 for the German presidency. From 2001 to 2012, he was a member of the German Ethics Council, and he is the recipient of many important prizes, none more important than, of course, the honorary degree from Bard College. Please <laughs> join me in welcoming Jens for a couple of words. Hail to you. What can I say after those thoughtful speeches we have heard? One strange thing for me as a German and those who are German or have been brought up in Germany is the word commencement for the graduation ceremony. I, I am not aware of any translation of that word uh, of that event, uh, designation of that event into in Germany that uh, reaches to the future. We usually have designations that reach into the past. Both are uh, then important, of course, in the, in the procedure, in the event, but commencing when one finishes studies uh, is a very dialectical uh, way of looking uh, at one's at one's life and at one's graduation. Myself, my graduation is now nearly uh, 60 years ago. It was in that gloomy year when the wall was erected here in Berlin. And the, the, the life of deep frustration uh, that we had to go through afterwards in our young lives has been hard enough and even our graduation was a non-graduation. We simply were, uh, were invited to go to the office of the faculty to get our paper and go away. There was no graduation ceremony at the time because everything, everybody was so depressed. If you look at this and then remember that uh, half through that period, after 30 years, uh, the wall came down here in Berlin, the wall that was around us, where you have studied uh, several years. You may have uh, uh, faced difficulty in, in tracing it even, the remnants of it. 30 years ago, the wall came down and the, the uh, most momentous uh, confrontation of two superpowers that very easily could have ended the whole civilization. In particular, one year after our ending studies, the crisis about Cuba and the and the atomic missiles that had been erected against, well, against the American continent could. I remember when I was, I was a doctor at the time in the surgical uh, department in my hometown, when all these news came about the crisis uh, uh, between Soviet Union and United States, that our main surgeon uh, went out of the operation room and said tomorrow will be the end of the world and he meant it very seriously. Well, uh, remembering this uh, strange graduation 60 years ago and then the 30 years that we reached that 
uh, all this could be ended and the confrontation ended. I think um, one could not, have, uh, could not have been more hopeful at the time. I know that you have studied under much better conditions and can look forward now to events that commence now, that will come to you now. I know that you have the chance to lead a successful life and a happy life. Nevertheless, all you will also have to face momentous decisions and momentous challenges. And looking forward to 60 years after your graduation, I can only wish you luck and happiness and that you and your descendants will live a happy life in spite of all the difficulties that, of course, you will have to face and to overcome. I wish you the best. It's there, the moment. Oops. I'm going to read the names relatively swiftly because it's a wonderfully big group. Um, but you definitely know when it's your tour. May I ask uh, Catherine Toll, the Dean of the College, Carrie Bystrom, the Associate Dean, Ulrike Wagner, the Director of the Language Program and the Coordinator of the Senior Thesis Colloquium, and Tan Tao who is Vice President for Enrollment and Strategic Initiatives at Bart Annandale. So, are you ready? Uh, everybody ready? <laughs> Ariana Arabacci. Nora Andrews. <laughs> Maheen Atif. <laughs> Farah Bada. Ibrahim Bosdemir. <laughs> Sofia Zbinowski Bradal. <laughs> Clara Sofia Canales Gutierrez. Mariam Chikaiti. <laughs> Alona Rivka Cohen. <laughs> Julia Mary Dunkhaus. Wilma Antonia Eberhardt. <laughs> Matej Gaginski. <laughs> Elena Gagowska. Anna Gersh. <laughs> Moa 
Muhammad Ali Gatz. Sanam Dechen Gurun. Margareta Hatting. Nana Yashvili. Lena Kotsuta. Tamar Nare. Nikolai Maximchuk. Morven Maniraya. Victoria Martinez. Keisha J. Mais. <laughs> Mariam Mitchellice. <laughs> Ahmad Mobayet. <laughs> Mohammad Faran Mot Fauzi. Ido Nahari. <laughs> Brenna Lucia O'Brien. <laughs> Santiago Olabari Oriol. <laughs> Lulu Outson. Alexander Pechmann. Paula Pinto Zabrano. Lana Zaprotnik. Elisabetta Projaeva. Cassidy Smith Putnam. Mohanad Kaikoni. Sebastian Joachim Schiller. Tanya Sampat Sharma. Bruno Siebeling. Nancy and Stanley. Thomas Stratford. Marta Vukovic. Cemal Zabatice.
almost done, and I'm all that stands before photo, food, champagne, so I'll make this very brief. Uh, I'm the managing director of Bard College Berlin based in Annandale. I'm at the bottom of all of your emails, so I guess it's fitting that I get the last word, but I would actually like to invite all of the graduates up in front of the stage. You'll, you'll have your chance at photos very briefly. So on Tuesday, a few of you heard Alfredo Haar echo Salvador Allende's quote, to be young and not a revolutionary is a biological contradiction. Haar's speech and the impressive cadre of the other speakers came on the occasion of the inauguration of the first new construction in the history of Bard College Berlin, the Rixfest of the Henry Kohner Hall. The events of that day had far less to do with the erection of facilities or adding facilities, but rather mark the transition from the experiment that was the European College of Liberal Arts to the institution that is Bard College Berlin today. The, this permanency manifested in concrete and glass was a rite of passage for the college, much in the way that the graduates of today are a key inflection point in their lives. The revolutionary idea that you could teach liberal arts in Europe, that you could allow students to be participants in their education instead of mere recipients of that education, that you could have a discourse with 17 to 25 year olds without dilution, that age is not a prerequisite for a colleague. These revolution ideas are what brought us today, that education must be democratic even when the politics governing it are not. Our experiment has been a success. The buildings rising on campus are evidence of that, but moreover, the, those standing before you today graduating are evidence of that. <laughs> Youth and revolution is inextricably linked, and if this group is any indication, it feels good to be young. Bard is a 150-year-old institution, but its modern history is only in the last four decades. Young for an institution. Bard College Berlin is younger yet at 20, but the story is only now being written. You, who we celebrate today, that stand before us, are the pros of its pages, the representatives of its worth, the ones who will carry your curiosity and critical inquiry to combat the issues that plague society and challenge convention. These traits are shared across all of Bard. It is in our institutional DNA. It is Bardian biology. So my charge to you is harness your youth, pursue truth. You are revolutionary, you are Bardians. Better yet, you are Bard Berliners. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Bard College Berlin Class of 2019.